uh, initially, e even though the idea was to uh, put reindeer in the hands of Alaska Natives, uh, the early years it didn't quite work out that way. Uh, and initially, the, the herds, the reindeer herds, were managed by uh, the missionaries, uh, uh, the white people, the non-native people, and uh, the apprentice program that Sheldon Jackson started. He hired uh, Sami reindeer herders to teach uh, the Alaska natives and how to herd reindeer. And in return for, for this instruction, uh, they received reindeer as payment. And uh, they received title full ownership of these reindeer. So early on, uh, we, we saw a pattern of ownership that wasn't entirely native. Uh, the missions controlled some, uh, the government controlled some, and also there was the non-native people, the Sami people, that uh, c <coughs> controlled, owned the reindeer. Uh, well, this upset some people that this didn't fit the original intent of introducing reindeer to Alaska to help the Native people. So there was some criticism. People criticized Sheldon Jackson for two things. One, there was not enough reindeer in Native ownership. And two, there was no separation of religion and education. Uh, so there was an investigation. Uh, Frank Churchill was sent by uh, the government to investigate, and and yes, uh, there there was a problem. Most of the reindeer were not in native hands, and uh, there was no separation of church and education, church and state. So actually, uh, Sheldon Jackson in 1905 was asked to resign. Uh, from 1905 on, uh, well, in the early 1900s, there was a, a push to put more reindeer into native ownership. Uh, reindeer herders were given loans of, of reindeer. Charlie Antetzirla was given a, a loan of 100 reindeer and he built the herd up until his herd was taken away to save the starving, or uh, supposedly, uh, stranded starving whalers at Point Barrow. Uh, his his reindeer were taken up there. Uh, the the whalers were not starving, but the reindeer remained to start uh, <coughs> to to start uh, the Point Barrow reindeer herd and uh, up there in the north. And during the early 1900s, we did see a lot more natives own reindeer. And it, was, it was actually a, a very good time for, for native reindeer herding. Uh, a lot of natives owned reindeer. Uh, uh, the populations, the herds were growing. Uh, they're spread from Barrow all the way down to uh, Bristol Bay. Uh, <coughs> reindeer all, all through the area. Uh, and uh, there was actually a very good market for the reindeer. We saw the beginning of the gold rush in Nome. Uh, there was a market for the reindeer. Things were looking, looking very well. The Board of Education would actually put on these reindeer fairs to get um, <clears throat> to, to bring uh, experienced reindeer herders together and, and to display their expertise. And, and get together and uh, everybody showed their skills, uh, young people were involved, and, and it was a great time in, in the reindeer industry. Uh, but things were about ready to change. Uh, there was a, a family, some individuals that moved to Nome, uh, the, the Lomans, uh, they were uh, very well tied politically uh, they they were very industrious and uh, capitalist, and they uh, came to Nome, and they uh, started an industry, and this industry was a, a reindeer meat industry. Uh, they began to purchase reindeer, uh, and primarily from uh, the Sami herders. And from 1914 on, they purchased uh, thousands of reindeer, I think over 14,000 reindeer to start up their herds. Uh, they heavily 
uh, capitalized. They got it, they secured a, a whole series, a, a lot of investors to invest in the reindeer industry. Uh, they developed a large infrastructure, extensive in infrastructure through uh, Western Alaska. They built slaughter facilities, processing facilities, corrals. You see a lot of these yet today. Uh, they they built a, a fascinating freezer storage area but up by Elephant Point. They dug a big hole in the ground and they put big, large vats of uh, and tubs of salt water. Uh, in these underground storage areas, and they open it up in the winter. And of, of course, all this cold, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the salt water and inside the storage area, uh, they would store uh, essentially a lot of cold and they would use that as uh, a, a means to freeze carcasses. Uh, the, a, a lot of carcasses, a lot of reindeer were slaughtered at the time and, and sold in the lower 48. The Lomans really wanted to establish a lower 48 market, and they went, went to great lengths to build that market. Uh, they, they advertised, they promoted reindeer sales um, in California, Minnesota, a number, a number of states, and and they were successful. They were beginning to uh, sell uh, substantial amounts of reindeer meat uh, in in the lower 48. But there was some pushback uh, by the, the cattle industry. The cattle industry saw ooh, uh, the, the reindeer industry as a threat, and so they lobbied for a passage of, of quite a few laws and regulations where it was illegal to sell reindeer meat in a lot of states, a lot of areas, and in a lot of institutions. Uh, I, someone told me that, and I don't know if it's true or not, They they uh, had, had heard there's still a law in the books in Minnesota where it's illegal still to this day to sell reindeer meat on trains. And so uh, the, the Lomans capitalized tremendously, uh, essentially overcapitalized uh, <clears throat> to uh, set up a, a reindeer industry. And Things uh, for them started to go badly. It was the beginning of the Depression. They invested a tremendous amount of money in this industry, and the markets were, were just not developing like they had thought and, uh, be because of the pushback of the, of the cattle lobby. Uh, and, and there was a lot of conflicts over, over the range. At the time, there was a common range um, every everyone used the same range. Uh, historically, there were traditional non-native ranges where uh, the the, the non-native herders would would uh, range their reindeer. The Lomans started to uh, use these areas. They 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 moved their animals on these traditionally uh, and native areas. And uh, of course, you would expect there was a lot of conflict. And, and so that was, uh, I spoke to it in a previous lecture about the passage of uh, the 1927 Alaska Grazing Act, and that was to hopefully uh, <clears throat> uh, deal with this range conflict. But the Lomans were worried about that once these range permits were starting to be issued, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, all, all of the students, you really need to go and read the, the, this grazing act because it's really quite interesting uh, because priority are given to Alaska natives for these uh, range permits. And so that, uh, with that, the Lomans were very worried about um, their range all of a sudden was going to be restricted. Uh, you could see the beginnings of the Great Depression plus their their marketing strategy didn't quite work out so they were were, <coughs> were uh, possibly uh, one looking to go bankrupt or getting out of the business uh, <coughs> also during this time uh, there was a lot of criticism by uh, native uh, reindeer herders and other peoples as well that uh, because of the Lomans uh, the non native ownership this did not meet with the intent of the original introduction. And there was a lot of disconnect. 
discontent um, because of this. Uh, and so people would go and make pleas to Congress and say, geez, you need to do something about this. Uh, you introduce these reindeer to help Native people, but then you have this the large white corporation that is starting to monopolize the industry. You need to do something. And, 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 and so uh, uh, Congress passed uh, uh, the Reindeer Act of 1937, um, <clears throat> limiting ownership of reindeer in Alaska to non-natives. Uh, at the time, the, the Lomans uh, actually promoted this because part of the Reindeer Act was the government would buy up all the non-native reindeer. And so the Lomans saw this as, wow, this is a way we can get out of the business. Uh, we want to get out of it anyway, and we would just have the government buy us out. So with the passage of the Reindeer Act of, of 1937, it actually didn't take till 1940 where the government came in and bought up all the non-native reindeer and the facilities and then uh, <clears throat> uh, began this, this period of transferring all, all the reindeer in Alaska over to Alaska natives. <clears throat> but. Uh, uh, the industry, uh, the, the reindeer populations, the industry uh, took a nosedive for a number of different factors. One was the, the World War II and the beginning of it. Um, <clears throat> the military uh, moved into Alaska. There was a lot of military presence. Uh, the, they brought a lot of money. They brought a lot of good paying jobs in there. And so a lot of the the native reindeer herders were just uh, getting out of the, the reindeer business, just letting their herds go because there was the availability of good paying, paying jobs. And plus we had the start of World War II and so we, uh, Alaska lost a lot of the reindeer herders. And <clears throat> this and a number of other factors, uh, we saw a huge decline in reindeer numbers. Yet, you know, in, it was estimated uh, in the late 1920s, early 1930s, there may have been 500 to 600,000 reindeer in Alaska. Reindeer were all across the state. It's difficult to go to, uh, in particular in western Alaska, if you dig through the history of any of the villages, it's, it's difficult to find a village that doesn't have reindeer somewhere in its history. Uh, reindeer were driven from Bristol Bay all the way to the Broad Pass area to, to try to help finance uh, the Alaska Railroad. The intention was reindeer were to be raised in the Broad Pass area, slaughtered, and the carcasses were to be uh, transported by the railroad to Whittier and put on ships and sold in the, in the lower 48. Uh, but we saw an overall decline uh, in, in the 40s and 50s of, of the industry because of predation, probably overgrazing, degradation of the grazing lands, and for the most part, a lot of people just walked away from the reindeer industry at the time. So we saw a real lull where not much happened at all in the 1940s and 50s. But, but still the government, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and a, a lot of people still believed in the reindeer industry and, and still <coughs> felt it had a lot of potential uh, in, to help uh, Alaska Natives in the state of Alaska, so they kept at it. And in the 1960s, um, <coughs> we, then everyone started an effort of uh, let's <coughs> uh, try to reinvigorate the reindeer industry. During the 1930s and 40s, they started, um, it ended up being a failure. The idea was to management of the reindeer should be under joint ownership uh, stock operations where you just had stock in a reindeer operation. That didn't work out very well at all. And, <clears throat> and so there was a big push in the 1960s is, is to put uh, uh, reindeer in the in private ownership with individual uh, <clears throat> Alaska natives. And, and the idea was um, uh, this person, uh, the individual, had a vested interest for his reindeer herd. He didn't have to worry about um, 
<clears throat> demands by anyone else, he would have a vested interest and therefore uh, put a lot more effort into being a success. <clears throat> That's the model where we have <clears throat> that we have now. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, both with the Alaska uh, Grazing Act and the Taylor Grazing Act, uh, a lot of public land, most of it on the Sierra Peninsula, uh, is is divided up into grazing areas and individual grazing permits or, or grazing permits are given to individual um, <clears throat> uh, owners or, or herders and this model seems to be working very well. Uh, <clears throat> uh, one, one individual is given exclusive grazing rights for a chunk of land, public land, um, <clears throat> He is uh, is required to use the land productively and conservatively. Um, he is supposed to, take, to practice good range management practices and take good care of his range. And to to be a success, um, it's uh, each individual herder has a vested interest to do uh, um, do to manage his reindeer sustainably, so he should practice uh, very good uh, <clears throat> range management techniques and, and practice very good reindeer husbandry. And that's where we are at today. <clears throat>